In this module, we're repeatedly going to have to be aware of the historical development of ideas. We've had the birth of scientific psychology at the end of the 19th century. We've had the behaviorist paradigm, which ran up until the 1950s. And then there's a shift, and this shift is going to come back again and again and again. It's after the Second World War, in the, towards the end of the 1950s, 1960s. This happens over a period of about 20 years. We're going to call it the cognitive turn, or sometimes the cognitive revolution. This is a change that affects all branches of science and leads to brand new set of metaphors for talking about things, things that have been talked about for many, 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 many years. Um, and at the center of all this is, of course, the development of what we call the computer. And the language of computing and that term information. Over this period, a new way of talking about minds, experience, behavior, and so on is going to emerge. And we can call it collectively the computational theory of mind. Now, that's not a single well-defined theory, but refers to a whole host of approaches that use the metaphor of the computer, thoughts that are informed by computers, and the language of information and information processing to talk about ourselves. We met it in the last lecture at a point at which, oddly enough, a linguist gets involved in the business of a psychologist. Here comes the interdisciplinary stuff. So when the behaviorists turn to language with Skinner's book, Chomsky, a young linguist, comes in and says, mm -mm. Now, Chomsky is going to be single-handedly responsible for the birth of a new kind of linguistics called generative linguistics that we will look at in great detail. So he had views on this. And indeed, theories of language suddenly move center stage in theories of mind at this point. Noam Chomsky is very important here. Of course, he's not the only character, but it is at this point that the whole business of linguistics becomes central to philosophy of mind. Now, you remember Skinner tried to address language by looking at it basically as a set of habits acquired by experience. That's a very empiricist point of view. Experience shapes you. Chomsky is going to come from a rationalist perspective, and this empiricist, rationalist polarity will be with us at all times. And from a rationalist point of view, he's already rubbished the idea that you could learn language simply by exposure to sentences spoken in your environment, because they're just weird and not enough, and people display a competence and a crea creativity in their use of language that could is implausibly derived from the sentences they heard around them. This means that they must have some inbuilt capacity for language. This becomes the notion of biological innateness, that something ready to learn language is baked into the biology somewhere. It's always been very vague where this is baked in, and the usual means of ad adopting a position like this is to hope that brain science will someday explain everything. It must be in the brain, maybe. <clears throat> we'll come back to that kind of claim. But because humans, at a young age, quickly and reliably learn the ambient language, and that they're biologically pretty much equivalent, it seems that whatever the biological basis for learning language is can't be dependent on any given culture. And to that extent, it must be, as it were, universal, a biological universal. This gives rise to the notion of a universal grammar, something baked into the biology, which makes the task of picking up the ambient language much easier, because you have a set of structures or processes or sensitivities which are ready to simply be shaped and informed by the ambient language. This greatly reduces the presumed task of the language learner. So we'll, we'll be discussing this in length when we come to language, very, very central topic. But linguistics and philosophy of mind come together here 
with this new discipline of computer science, computational science, and it creates something very, very powerful. That's Noam Chomsky at the top of the picture, and that's Jerry Fodor, a colleague of his, Rutgers University, philosopher of mind, and they worked very, very closely together, and were, it was through partly through their partnership that questions that seemed to be the province of the discipline of linguistics became questions that interested everyone interested in minds and cognition. Now, around this time, Jerry Fodor wrote two books which are useful for us because they give an idea of a new kind of thinking that has emerged. It's not going to be stimulus response thinking at all, like the behaviorists. It's going to be computational thinking informed by exposure to computers. So the first book here is called The Modularity of Mind. And we already had you read an essay by Marvin Minsky, who belongs squarely in this camp, Computational Theory of Mind, who said mind is what brain does. That's his view of things. And on that view, the brain closely resembles a piece of hardware, while mind, cognition, perception, the mental stuff, closely resembles software. Remember, this is an analogy. This is not a fact about brains or minds. There are no such... This could not be a factual story. It's a way of thinking. And when you start to think like this, Jerry Fodor took something, learned something from the people who write computer programs, and thinking along these lines, he said, well, look, we're, we're asking an awful lot of the brain. It's got to perceive the world. It's got to think. It's got to remember. It's got to pay attention. There's got to be an executive controller. There's whatever he thought a mind must have. Looks like an awful lot for one thing to do. Well, the way we deal with this in computers is we don't write a program that does everything. We write small programs that do one or two things well, and then we piece them together so that in their assembly, we get something capable of tackling a big task. So we decompose tasks into smaller problems, and these small problems only make limited use of information. This idea Jerry Fodor took as being a way of thinking about the, what he called the architecture of mind. In as much as we can say that a mind has different functions, if that makes sense, then it would make sense to suggest that these are solved by different systems. So we get a modularity, different sub-programs, as it were, different parts of this presumed cognitive system, which are responsible for different things. Um, so these modules would be, as he called them, informationally encapsulated. So if your module only deals, for example, with sound patterns in English, you don't want it being informed by color patterns in the world around you. Likewise, in a complicated program like Microsoft Word, there's a module which speaks to the printer and deals with sending your document to the printer, but it's not worried about screen display or it's not worried about interacting with the keyboard. So this is software engineering brought to bear on thinking about minds. Each of these modules serves a specific function, that is, it's domain-specific. So this is a new way of thinking. Remember, it's not a scientific result. It's a way of thinking uh, about minds in general. And, and then he went one step further and brought linguistic questions into the heart of this emerging computational philosophy of mind with a book called The Language of Thought. That's an idea that had been around in various quarters, but he made it central to the integration of Noam Chomsky's view of language with his view of the computational theory of mind. Um, nobody's ever known how to talk about thinking, about what thoughts are. And we'll come to this again and again. The word thought, like the word mind, will be spectacularly poorly defined all along in this module. So in order to address this, Jerry Fodor takes some aspects of what we might call thought, and he argues that some of those aspects are a lot like language. You can think of this as being Jerry Fodor thinking about his inner speech, if that makes sense to you, and saying, ah, that looks like a thought, and it looks like language. He went further, though, and suggested that when you, for example, think a thought like, oh, I'd love a pie. Now, I put words on that and I said them out loud. 
But one could imagine the thought of moving towards a pie almost without the words, and yet it would still bear a close resemblance to the structure of that I would like a pie from me towards the pie. Now, Jerry Fodor never said that all this will account for everything you want to talk about as thinking, and he's right, it doesn't. In fact, people took his statements rather too literally, interestingly enough, and he had to write another book later on saying, hey, I didn't quite mean it like that. <laughs> um, but what he's trying to do is approach the nebulous and hard to talk about domain of thought and say, look, some aspects of this seem to be language-like. And we'll discuss this in class, and your thoughts on this are very, very welcome. We're not going to go into details here, but I want you to note that around the, shortly after the Second World War, in the 1950s and 60s, we have a huge revolution in thought. There's the new metaphor of the computer and all that software-hardware thinking and learning from programmers. There's a new concept in town called information. Now, that word had been very vague before like news is a vague word, and it didn't mean much more than news. Then in the 1940s, a guy called Claude Shannon came up with a mathematical theory of the word information as it functions in a particular engineering context in passing messages. That unfortunately gave rise to the belief that information was now something that we had a mathematical grip on. Again, people misunderstood what was a limited solution and started talking in terms of information without really knowing what they're talking about. Something that goes on to this day. But information was now part of the vocabulary with which we thought about ourselves. And we, with these we get a new way of thinking about minds and brains and the computational theory of mind will ultimately give rise to a specific kind of psychology which we'll call cognitive psychology. So it's this narrow expression of a particular psychological theory in computational terms, that's what we mean by cognitive psychology. It is by no means the same thing as cognitive science. It will also give rise to something which exerts a pernicious, a very strong influence on our lives to this day, and that's the dream of artificial intelligence. Now, this is a term that you're familiar with from a contemporary point of view. But what those words, artificial intelligence, mean now bears almost no relation to what they meant when they were first introduced. Back in the 1960s, as people started playing with little computational models, and they were the simplest possible models, they began to have grandiose dreams that computers could be minds. Computers shuffled symbols around according to rules. And Two very clever guys, Alan Ewell and Herb Simon, even came up with the absolutely implausible hypothesis that if you have a physical system which can shuffle symbols around, that that's the basis for what they called intelligent action. Now, quite what intelligence was, nobody has ever defined to anybody's satisfactory satisfaction. Um, but the fact that computers were very good at shuffling, shuffling symbols according to rules made people develop notions of their own minds. And of course, these guys, always, as always guys, always think of themselves as the most intelligent things in the universe. And they dreamt that you could make an artificially intelligent machine. When we look at some examples of this, they're going to look childish to you. And they should, because the term has morphed. And the sense in which artificial intelligence is used today bears no relation to these early pipe dreams. We'll be discussing contemporary senses of artificial intelligence later. Here's a little puzzle I had as a kid back in the 1970s. You get a block of um, these little disks and you're asked to move that stack from one end to the other. There's three invisible pins here never placing a larger disc on a smaller disc. It's a kind of a puzzle. I got it for Christmas one time, and I solved it in a few minutes, and it was a fairly easy thing. But because you solved this using reason, at that time, this looked like, oh, this is the kind of thing that humans are really brilliant at, like thinking and stuff. And it was the kind of thing that it turned out to be fairly easy to write computer programs for. 
We'll be discussing the further development of this and the extension into more complicated domains like chess later. At this time also, people were astonished, and I mean astonished, at being able to type words into a computer terminal and have words appear back at the computer terminal. Doesn't sound so brilliant today, but here's an example of a, an early artificial intelligence program reasoning and interacting with the person who's typing words in and getting words typed back. They're talking about the contents of a, ver of a little game world, like the simplest, most humble uh, version of something like a video game world, like Grand Theft Auto. But in this world, there's only cubes and cones, and there's only a few of them. And you can read through this yourself. Um, you can see that the person is reasoning with the computer, and they're using natural language. Now, this doesn't, won't look terribly science fiction-y to you. It looks rather primitive. But at the time, this inflamed people's imaginations, as our imaginations will be inflamed tomorrow by some new fancy thing that computers do. Now, these early developments of the computational theory of mind and their extension into artificial intelligence all had a strongly rationalist focus. That is, whatever they're pursuing, whatever the dream is, it seems to be centered on our ability to reason and to think logically, which takes us back to René Descartes, right? And we'll have good reason to question whether reasoning is the most important or salient feature of your mental life. We'll have a whole lecture devoted to reasoning. Um, such approaches tell us very little about the richness of human experience, so they're more challenged when it comes to that. Um, but they have become enormously influential to the point that artificial intelligence and cognitive psychology have become something of an orthodoxy within our techno-scientific world that I hope this module gives you the means to critique, to realize that Thinking along these lines is not obligatory, has been done in a specific historical context, and can be very misleading if taken as simply the exposure of truths about minds or persons. Right, lots to talk about in class.